When you really hear the statement, there's nowhere to stand, to be free, then you start to notice what is aversive to you or what is desirable, what you crave. And you see the way your mind imprisons you in your desires or in your aversions. And as you go deeper into that study, you understand that to be free means to be fully with what is, just as it is, just as it is. Hey everyone, it's Raghu, and I'm back with Ramdas Here and Now podcast. And uh, I'm slotting in here because I actually found something. I'm, I'm still, you know, really excited when I find something of Ram Dass's that resonates with me. It's still, uh, it's, it's exciting. So I wanted to share it with everybody. And I know uh, you're used to uh, getting an intro from Jackie, but she'll be back next time. And uh, I, before I get into what it is that excited me, uh, I would just want to mention our wonderful partner who sponsors and helps us to continue to be able to put out podcasts the way that we do with so many different podcasts. What do I think we have maybe up to 15 now or something? And um, so this is Magic Mind. And I talked to you last time I did this uh podcast intro and i i told you you know it's a wonderful elixir that has just incredible ingredients by the way one of them uh this is cordyceps there's no better thing to take right now uh in in this season that we're in the winter of all the flus and all that stuff uh just wanted to mention that alongside of a number of other uh, wonderful ingredients So, yeah, last time I mentioned how it really works related to focus. For me, that's important and just as important because what I do is basically I act as a producer for Love Server member doing all kinds of different things. And I got to be productive, okay? And these wonderful, by the way, they're very small bottles, easy to transport, and easy to drink, it tastes good. I mean, and I am the one around taste desk because I don't like concoctions that have any sideways back taste, if you know what I mean. So, uh, yeah, so those two things are, are really super important for everybody in terms of being in the world and and for me, all the different hats that I have to wear. So it really helps with efficiency, it really does. And I want to mention that uh, if you get over to magicmind.com slash Ramdas, you get, if you're subscribing, you get 50% off. That's a huge savings off a subscription where you, every week you get what you need. And if it's just a one time to check it out, you get 20% off. And the discount code's Ramdas. And this is going on for the next 10 days. Magicmind.com slash Ramdas. There you go. So this talk that got me excited, uh, it just follows the core teachings of, of Ram Dass that have been expressed by him and we've reproduced it in many different ways. In particular, this talk was used as part of the film, you know, obviously a, a small excerpt, uh, Becoming Nobody which we urge everybody to see. It's just a, a fabulous portrait of, uh, of Ram Dass's core, core teachings and what he really represents in this life. So, and what, what is exciting to me is the redundancy of going through and getting straight the perspective around identity. Because we are all so absolutely um, caught 
And you know what it does? I mean, thinking we are who we act in the world, who we act in families, uh, how we act in society. We have what Ram Dass called the spacesuit. That's what we're calling this, taking off the spacesuit. And, uh, you know, these identities, he talks about the identities we, we uh, wear in our lives and how ill-fitting this spacesuit felt for him and the feeling of freedom he found when he was able to take it off. It's, it's a huge deal, everybody, and core to uh, us being able to, to live happier lives, not feeling so caught. There's a great story, Zumbach the Tailor. I don't know, many of you may know it. It's one of Ram Dass's favorite stories and where a person goes in to the tailor and says, okay, I need this suit altered. And the guy says, okay, come back in a, in a week or whatever. And he comes back and he says, go ahead here, try it on. So he tried it on. And, and the, the tailor's going, wow, you look terrific. Meanwhile, it was completely ill-fit. He, everything was wrong about it. The sleeve was longer on one side and the other. The pants, same thing. It was too tight here and too loose there. It was awful. But the, uh, the tailor insisted, it, you look fabulous. This is a good analogy for what happens to us in life. We, we have this identity and everybody's going, wow, you're great. You look great. You know, and but maybe you don't feel that great all the time. So this is why this talk, uh, and you know, Ramdas uses his journey as a guide uh, for what he's experiencing. Um, and then, of course, because this happened so strongly with Ramdas, and has happened with many others. Sometimes the use of psychedelics, not just psychedelics, but spiritual practices, eventually it's you, the suit starts to, shall we say, self-correct <laughs> in the fit, you know. And at that point, it's like taking a breath of fresh air. And really it is, 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 it's about a perspective that suddenly allows you to be us, to be more spacious about everything, how we react to stuff, being able to have mindfulness about how we are relating and creating this identity, this spacesuit, as Ram Dass said. So, and he goes, once the object of the game shifted from getting high to getting free, he started Ramdas chose to stop pushing away all of the things that brought him down. Instead, he embraced. And that's, uh, you know, we, oh, we had a great retreat last year, by the way, with Lama Sultra Malioni. And her th she wrote a fabulous book called Feeding the Demons. It's how to embrace this negativity rather than push it away. It's really fabulous. Um, what else do I want to say? Just one other little thing that he mentions in this uh, podcast. It's, he's, he ref references everybody coming together in wherever he was. In this, where was this? I think it was in Knoxville, Tennessee. He's, we come together for heart-to-heart -heart resuscitation. Resuscitation. And, you know, uh, I don't know, you, some of you also may know Roshi Joan Halifax, and she's on in many of our programs and podcasts and so on. And I would meet her because I, I don't know, I'd end up either being still in Maui at the turn of the year into the new year. And she would always come then with when Ramdas was alive. And she'd say, I've come for my heart transplant. And so I understand what Ramdas is saying here that the way in which we get together is like heart resusc resuscitation. Right? We assure our hearts that we know deep down, what we know deep down inside ourselves to be true is true. And how that happens is with satsang. You know, because we are, sometimes we're surrounded by people who, who just have no faith, no trust in, in, in the intuitive part of ourselves, in the truth of who we are. Um, we're very busy, and this is the, 
the last thing about this, the idea of uh, understanding the spacesuit, the identity and the attachment to it and how we walk around with this projection, it's, uh, it's the same thing as that we're busy with our minds trying to think our way out of, the, out of that box that the mind has created in the first place. This is a, a conundrum to ponder. Anyhow, that's why we come together and share the truth. That's why we do these podcasts uh, to share whatever we we have, our individual experiential wisdom. Um, we we are just really happy. And by the way, boy, I'm sure glad I thought of this. One of the ways that we come together is through these retreats. And now we have this this one uh, in uh, coming up in August, August 15th in Boone, North Carolina, right near Charlotte. And it's a fabulous property up in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Christian also will be there, Spring Wash. Um, we got David Block of the Human Experience doing this incredible music and uh, synthesis with Ramdas Audio. David Nickton is going to teach meditation. Nina Rao is going to be, it's going to be fantastic. Go to ramdas.org and take a look at events and you'll get the link over there and see all of what's happening. That's it. That's all the sponsorship we can handle today. So don't forget Magic Mind. Go to magicmind.com slash ramdas and uh, enjoy. We will see you next time. Through sleet and snow we come <laughs> together. For what reason do you think? I mean, I'm charming and fascinating, but that's hardly a reason to come out in the evening. I think we come together um, for a sort of heart-to-heart -heart resuscitation to reassure our hearts that what we know deep inside ourselves to be true is true. That often in our daily lives we, we are surrounded by people that don't trust that intuitive truth. And they are and we are very busy with our minds trying to think our way out of the box that our minds have created in the first place. And sometimes it's nice to just come together and share our truth very simply and sort of see where we are, what our predicament is, as simply as we can as fellow human beings assess it. I don't in any way assume that I know something you don't know. I just say it well. I'm a mouth for a process that a lot of us are going through. The other night I was speaking in New York, and as you could see, some of you, before the lecture, I usually walk around saying hello to people. So I can tune in to who we are tonight, each evening. And I came up to one person, he said, how do you do? I'm a psychiatrist. How do you do? A few people later, somebody said to me, how do you do? I'm a schizophrenic. <laughs> then I walked over the other side and somebody said to me, how do you do? I just got out of prison. And a few people later, somebody said, how do you do? And I said, what do you do? He said, I'm a judge. A woman came up to me and she said, I hope you'll talk about how to deal with teenagers. I'm having terrible troubles with my children. And later, a beautiful young man came up to me and he said, I really can't handle my folks at all. I can't hack them. 
And I thought, isn't this bizarre? What could I say that is common to all these people? But what is common to all these beings is just exactly what we are speaking about and to. Like, are we an an audience and speaker in Knoxville? That's one of the levels of reality. Or do we really want to feed that drama so heavily? Maybe you and I are entities that took birth on this plane and we're trying to figure out what are we doing here and what do we do about it? I've been working for 25 years to become holy or divine or whatever you call that. I've really worked at it. I mean, I've done all the things you're supposed to do. I have meditated and fasted, made pilgrimages, sat at people's feet, prayed, read holy books, done dancing. Recently, I met an old colleague of mine from the Harvard days. After about 15 minutes, he said, you know, Dick, you haven't changed a bit. (laughs) Hmm. Hmm. but that's in the eyes of the beholder that at that level I I'm familiar to him that there are inner things that have changed And I'd like to sort of reflect about some of those this evening. Because some of the changes are subtle. At first, we, those of us that started to awaken, and we'll talk about that means in a minute, we had, there was a lot of pizzazz in it. There was a lot of showbiz in it. It was very exciting, and we thought we were immediately going to turn into butterflies. We thought we'd get enlightened within a few weeks. And now I'd say one of the changes is I've stopped counting. That I'm very patient. And I sense that the process of transformation is much subtler than I thought it was. And in a way much more um, profound, profound. When you and I were born, we were born into these space suits. It's like they travel to the moon in those suits. Well, we have suits on too to allow us to function on this plane. This is my suit right here. This is it. And this suit has a control mechanism, comes with brain. And I spent a number of years learning how to use the suit. Prehensile, how to grab things. Then how to use the computer that runs the suit. How to walk and move, how to plan, remember. And I developed a structure about myself and the universe, and it was called ego. It all comes with the suit. It all comes with the territory. The ego is part of the suit. Most people, when they are born into their suit, forget that they were born into the suit and they think they are the suit. The other way I've said it is when we are born, we go into somebody training because our parents are somebody and they're going to make sure we become somebody. And we become somebody. I'm Richard. I'm somebody. And we have all these characteristics. 
like I am, and whatever you put after that. How do you do? I'm a psychiatrist. How do you do? I'm a mother. It's a somebody. We are somebody. Just not nobody. We're somebody. And we each project and are involved in these models in our heads of our somebodyness. And we are constantly looking into each other's eyes saying, am I somebody? Am I enough somebody? And the more somebody somebody else is, the more they can tell you whether you're really somebody or not. <laughs> and uh, I became somebody. People came up and said, you're really somebody. You must be very happy to be so much somebody. But the fact was that I wasn't. I mean, I smiled a lot, but I wasn't happy inside. But everybody said, you must be happy because you are somebody. Because in this culture, the myth is of you finally make it your somebody. But my somebody has felt a little bit like I was trying to wear, somebody had prepared a suit for me that didn't fit. And in order to make it fit, I had a kind of scrunch. And I'd come along in my scrunched up somebodyness, and everybody would say, oh, how do you do? What a beautiful suit you're wearing. You must be very happy. And I'd smile gamely, but I wasn't. So I decided I must be sick, which is a reasonable conclusion if everybody tells you you're happy and you're not. <laughs> so I went to a therapist an analyst, and he said that for a small pittance, <laughs> he would teach me how to wear his suit. <laughs> and his suit was kind of weird in a different kind of a way, see? So I, of course, wanted to wear his suit because his suit was even more somebody than my suit had been, see? So I put on his suit. Then I didn't see people anymore. I just saw psychosexual stages of development. I saw <laughs> anal retentives and early phallics and things like that. Hmm. And I figured, well, that's the best I'm going to do this life. Everybody must be in, mis maybe everybody's happy but me, but I'm going to be miserable. I might as well just adjust to it. And then I had an experience in which I shed my suit. I came up for air. In a way, I went out of my mind. And I experienced as I came out of my suit, the suit that my mind had created, that I had bought. As I took off the suit, I felt at home, I felt present. It felt extremely familiar to me, even though as an adult in society, I didn't remember having been in this space before. I was always constantly checking to everybody to see if I was enough somebody so that I would be allowed to exist. And suddenly I felt understanding, compassion, clear, at home, familiar, very loving, very very, very aware. So about two hours later, when the chemical wore off, <laughs> I um, started to come back into my suit. And I went, oh, no, but I didn't, I didn't know the mantra or whatever you did to not come back, so I came back. Well, it's one thing to have grown so used to a discomforting situation that you've sort of accepted it. But once you've tasted that there is another possibility, there's a whole different quality of discontent. And I was determined at that point to get out of suits which is called getting high. And I made every effort to get high. 
I meditated, I traveled to India, I did all the things one did, and I found ways in India to stay so high. I could do it through fasting and chanting and breath control and being around holy people. And I could stay so high that I was just, um, energy was pouring out of my head, my pupils were large, I was feeling loving and present and clear, and I, boy, this is it. Then I'd come back to America, and I'd go to visit the family, and my father would say a simple thing like, got a job yet. <laughs> okay. 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 And I'd crash, and I'd say, the family really brings me down. Okay. And I began to get a whole list of things that brought me down. Family brought me down, cities brought me down, economics brought me down, politics brought me down, the bomb brought me down, a lot of things. And I found that it was like I was wearing a new suit, brings me down. I'm very high, it brings me down. Stay away from me, I'm very high. And I suspected something was wrong. Everybody else was doing the same thing. I felt perhaps maybe if I renounced everything enough, it would click in. If I renounced my humanity enough, I would become divine. So I renounced as much as I could. But all I did was end up a horny celibate. <laughs> and I was busy not doing this and that like smokers. I haven't smoked in three years, two months, 22 hours, and 14 minutes. I'd probably die from not smoking. <clears throat> uh -huh. Uh -huh. That didn't seem like the way. And I kept hearing messages in the spiritual literature that said, if you push away anything, you're not free. If you either are grabbing at something or avoiding something, it's got you. And I could see that I was really avoiding these planes of consciousness in which I existed physically and I existed psychologically. See, there had been a time when I was primarily a physical entity. I would identify with my physical body. Then I was busy, say, not going bald. That's who I was. I mean, that's, I was very aware of how much hair everybody had. And I had a long piece of hair and I kind of wore it like this. And, and I always knew which way the wind was blowing, I'll tell you. It's like, it's like, I mean, I remember really taking my body very seriously, not only at puberty, but on and on through years, noticing myself in a mirror every time I passed and making believe I wasn't, but doing it. I mean, I look now, I, like I look at this foot. This is a 55-year-old decaying foot. It's like you go out in the woods and there's tree trunks and they're all kind of some old ones and they're decaying, they got moss on them. And, and they're turning back into the earth. Well, that's what this looks like. It's like a nice decaying foot. And I look at this hand and it's got veins and wrinkled skin and it's really quite beautiful. If I thought it was my hand, I'd freak. <laughs> yeah. 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 But it's just a hand. It's just a set of phenomena. There's no big deal about it. Like I've got these spots on my head. There's a porcelana ad that it says, they call these aging spots, I call them ugly. Okay. <laughs> well, now that I'm not so busy being my body, I say they call them ugly, I call them aging spots. They're just what is, they're just the way things are. Bodies get old and then they drop away. 
So I see that the body is a relatively real thing, and I'm certainly honoring it. I'm taking good care of it. And it's like my Volvo. You know, I change the oil. It's an old Volvo, and someday it will be had enough, and it will get compressed. <laughs> Ramana Maharshi, the beautiful Indian saint, was dying and all his devotees were crying, don't leave us, don't leave us. And he looked confused. He said, don't be silly, where can I go? It's like I'm just selling the Ford, it's no big deal. But if you identify with your body, you really think death's a big deal. You milk it as a melodrama for all it's worth. Then I thought I was my personality for a long time. I mean, when I was a therapist, I was really a therapist. I mean, I needed to be a therapist. So you were all my patients, potentially. Everybody was a potential patient, and I was busy therapizing. And there's another plane of individual difference. You could look up here and you say, he's an Aries, that explains everything. And that's the astral plane. Physical, psychological, social, astral. All these planes, we have individual differences. We can peg each other. You are different than you and her and she's different from him, and etc. The spacesuit also has, you know, when the fellows that went to the moon now, they had these little glass windows and you come up to somebody else in one of these spacesuits. How do you do? I'm a psychiatrist. So he's wearing a psychiatrist spacesuit. And you look in the window, and there's somebody in there. Are you in there? I'm in here. How did you get into that one? That's why the eyes are called the windows of the soul. It's like you see in and you see another awareness or another entity inside there, just packaged differently. And everybody just is so busy taking their packaging seriously. We've gotten so, we're just perfect for advertising campaigns. We take all the packaging seriously. We completely ignore the product. We're so fascinated with the package. And what I realized was that as I came up for air or threw off the suit, the suit was all packaging. My somebodyness. My somebodyness this round, this birth. And when the suit was off, there was a different quality of my sense of the universe and of myself. I would look around and I would see that other beings were all us, just us with different curriculums or different jobs. It's like we're all one and then I come back into my separateness to my body and my personality. I'd say, it's like we'd say we're all one, but it's my television set. See, it's you go up into the connection to everything and then you come back into your separateness. Well, I was still trying to busy to get out of all this stuff because it was kind of, um, I mean, this body was getting older. There was no big bargain. As Suzuki Roshi, the beautiful Zen master said, life is like setting sail in a boat which is about to go out in the ocean and sink. And my personality was so neurotic. I mean, who wanted to be that? You know, it's interesting. In all the years that I have been in analysis for some years back, then I was a professor of psychology. I taught Freud at Harvard. Well, I taught about Freud. I didn't teach Freud. And then um, I took drugs for years, and then I studied yoga, and I sat at my guru's feet. In all these years, I have never gotten rid of one neurosis. Isn't that amazing? 
Not one. I mean, all my sexual weirdities, all my anxieties, they're all there. The only difference is that while before they were like these huge, big monsters that would take me over, so suddenly I turn like the portrait of Dorian Gray, you know, you know, into something horrible. Now they're like little schmooze, you know. Oh, there's that sexual perversity. Come on in and have tea, you know. It was like, they're sort of like familiar old friends now. I mean, I still have a personality. All, I, I've watched all the great spiritual teachers. They're all neurotic. I mean, they're all, they all have personality style, it's called. It's your, your neurosis becomes your style after a while. It's the, see, it's style instead of a problem. It's just style. Okay? One great saint in India always wears earmuffs. I don't know why. I mean, that's just his thing, you know. And he's... <laughs> <laughs> but I was so busy pushing them away and there were a lot of things that there were clues that were helping me see that there was a problem about trying to push away the physical and psychological and mythic or astral plane archetypal I think the greatest guide to helping me change that around that made it clearest to me was my friend Emmanuel. And uh, Emmanuel is a uh, disembodied being. They're all around these days, if you've noticed. There are a dime a dozen there. Um, and I should advise you that all beings that don't have bodies aren't wise. There are as many confused, disembodied beings as there are embodied beings. Imagine somebody here that's really screwing up, and then they die. And they figure, I'll send back a message, see, so they... <laughs> Buy can tuna, you know, and they go, ooh, ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we tend to, because we can't not have bodies, we think that beings that don't have bodies really must know, but they don't know. They just, they're just like on a different channel. It's just like tuning from Dynasty to Dallas, you know, I mean, it's the same neurosis. But, uh, my, uh, I don't speak directly to Emmanuel. A friend of mine, Pat, does. She tells me what he says. And uh, the reason I like Emmanuel is because he agrees with me. <laughs> I mean, that's what you've got to do. You've got to trust your intuitive judgment as to whether, you know, somebody has something to say that's worth listening to. And Emmanuel is quite light and playful. I, I said to him, Emmanuel, what do I tell people about death? Because I work with dying people. And he said, Ram Dass, tell people that death is absolutely safe. <laughs> that one creeps up on you. Watch it. That's it. <laughs> he said, it's like taking off a tight shoe. So I said to him, Emmanuel, what am I doing on earth? Who made this error? I mean... <laughs> What, what is this? And he said, Ram Dass, you're in school. Why don't you try taking the curriculum? Why don't you try being human? See, I never thought of that. <laughs> I was busy trying to become divine because my humanity seemed like a real drag. You mean to say, yes. that my incarnation, that all this, is the curriculum for me as a spiritual entity through which I can awaken. Awaken out of the illusion that I am only my separateness so that I can end up being 
as Christ said, in the world, but not of the world. Now, it's interesting because most spiritual practices are designed to take you out of your separateness, to take you closer to the one, to the unitive state, to the to the, the spirit that infuses form, but to take you out of that rigid attachment to form. Ecstatic prayer and devotional practices, meditation, all these techniques are designed to lift you and to take you into these realms where you look out and you see we're all brothers and sisters, or if you go further out, you see there's only one of us. It's just one awareness that's in all these different forms. And many people see the spiritual journey as primarily that for going out. And back in the early 70s, I remember when I would lecture, I would be saying to half the audience, come on, get up, go out, let's go out, let's get out here together, come on into the one, let go of your heavy separate drama for a little while, come on up. And then as the years proceeded, I began to see that a lot of people had figured out how to do that, and they were like out in la-la land. <laughs> and about half the audience, I was saying, come on up, and the other half I was saying, come on, get your act together, learn your zip code, get, your, get a job, for God's sakes, you know. <laughs> Clean your act up, you know. Get your okay. I saw that the, to complete the cycle is to go to awaken out of the separateness so that you don't any longer identify yourself exclusively as John or Mary or Beth or David, but you see that you are awareness that has incarnated and taken form as so-and-so or a certain person. And then, not to stay out there, because that's standing somewhere, but to then close the circle and be in the world and yet do it from that place and this place. In other words, do it so that you're not busy being stuck in it and you're not busy denying it. And you become what Don Juan in those books by Carlos Castaneda, Castaneda says, you become an impeccable warrior. He puts it rather, I think, crudely. He said, you huff and you puff and you make believe it matters, even though you know that it doesn't. He calls it controlled folly. And it's at that time when you have cultivated that spaciousness, that awareness, that spiritual identity, and then you infuse that into your form that you learn the meaning of life as a play or a dance or a game or a delight or as a great curriculum in which, see, at first, it's interesting, at first, when before you awaken, you want to get high all the time and everything that brings you down, you push away. Once you understand that the the object isn't to get high, just to get out there. The object is to be free. And free means you don't stand anywhere. You don't stand out there or in here or any place. You just, you're free. You understand what freedom is? There's no holding. There's no house you're living in. You're not, you're not imprisoning yourself in a conceptual structure. Once you want to be free, then the very things that brought you down, you begin to realize, why does it bring me down? It doesn't bring me down, it's just doing what it's doing. Why is it bringing me down? It's bringing me down because there's something in my mind that it knows, that it catches. And once you want to be free, you begin to focus on those things which bring you down because they show you your own secret stash of clinging of mind. 
in the early days, I used to hate it when I would be brought down or caught up or get angry or get horny or get frightened or get lonely. Now I love it. As the poet Rumi says, on one side of you is water. When you go into the water, you think it's going to make you happy. On the other side is a fire. You think it's going to burn you. But once you have tasted of God or spirit, you go towards fire to burn away that which is burnable, and you go into the fire and you end up in the water of happiness. And it's really quite bizarre how it changes around. How the stuff that at first was aversive to you becomes fascinating. Like, I find that I work with, over the years, I've worked with inmates and penitentiaries, I've worked with dying people, I work with AIDS patients and cancer patients. I work with people that have heavy stuff in life. For me, that's the, that's really grace that I can do that. Because as a, as a separate entity, Perhaps the deepest fear we have as separate entities is the fear of dying. And what better way for me to work with that fear than to be around dying? So the chance to be around it is like a gift for me. While other people say, do you mean you spend time with dying people? My goodness, that's very courageous. That must be hard. No, that's grace. Can you see how it flips? When you really hear the statement, there's nowhere to stand to be free then you start to notice what is aversive to you or what is desirable, what you crave. And you see the way your mind imprisons you in your desires or in your aversions. And as you go deeper into that study, you understand that to be free means to be fully with what is, just as it is, just as it is. Most of us are very reactive against or for. We see some uh, or uh. To be fully in the moment is to just be with what is, to look at it all, and not only to look at it all, but to acknowledge that you be it all. If you would be free, there is nothing you can push away. And yet most of us feel that in order to be happy, we must push away suffering. We don't, we really, I gave at the office, I've given, I don't want to know about the have-nots because I want to be happy. And yet, as long as you turn off anything, it's got you and you're not free. Now, to open fully to what is, to look and see that behind schizophrenic and psychiatrist and judge and inmate and da and da and man and woman and look and see what's behind all of it. See the veils, see through the veils. There's a beautiful poem by a Buddhist monk named Thich Nhat Hanh. I won't read it all, I'll just read part of it. He said, I am the mayflower metamorphizing on the surface of the river, the mayfly. I am also the bird which, when spring comes, arrives in time to eat the mayfly. I am a frog swimming happily in the clear water of a pond. I am also the grass snake who, approaching in silence, feeds itself on the frog. 
I am the child in Uganda, all skin and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks. I am also the merchant of arms selling deadly weapons to Uganda. I am the 12-year-old girl, refugee on a small boat, who throws herself into the ocean after being raped by a sea pirate. I am also the pirate, my heart not yet capable of seeing and loving. I am a member of the Politburo, with power in my hands. I'm also the man dying slowly in a forced labor camp. My joy is like spring, so warm it makes flowers bloom in all walks of life. My pain is like a river of tears, so full it fills up all the four oceans. Please call me by my correct names so that I can hear at the same time all of my cries and my laughs so that I could see that my joy and pain are but one. Please call me by my correct names so that I could become awake, so that the door of my heart be left open, the door of compassion. To embrace it all, to look at the universe as it is. There's death, there's birth. Because if you're going to be fully in this moment, fully in this moment, fully alive to this moment, are you happy? Yeah, I'm happy. There is flowers blooming. There is a baby being born and bringing joy at this moment. Sure, I'm happy. Well, are you sad? Yeah, I'm sad. There is a child dying every 45 seconds of needless starvation. There are people torturing other people. There are people afraid for their lives at this very moment. Yes, I'm sad. All of it. If you deny one to do the other, you close down. If you close down, you are not free. Free has a horrible beauty to it. It's looking into the eyes of the world as it is and saying, yes, yes, yes. Now, how do you do that? Well, I'll tell you what has happened to me. As I have quieted my mind, I've noticed that my heart was veiled by my mind. And the veil of mind around my heart, you've got to understand that the mind, as I said, was the computer for the spacesuit. The mind, the intellect, the thinking mind, is an instrument of your separateness. It's there to preserve your separateness. And it armors the heart so that you won't be overwhelmed from outside. But it also armors the heart so you won't be overwhelmed by the heart. Because the quality of our heart is the statement, my heart goes out to you. If you're in your real deepest heart, you'd give away anything. Take my house, take my car, take, take it all. And the mind's saying, now wait a minute. Because the mind is instructed to protect our separateness. That's who we made it to be. That's what the ego is about. As I quieted my mind, and I was able to connect to that deeper, what in Chinese is called the sin sin, H-S-I-N, sin sin, the heart mind, the intuitive heart mind, not the emotional heart, but the deepest heart mind, the deepest place of my heart or the deepest awareness, whichever way you want to call it. When I looked at the universe, I was awed by its incredible beauty. It's what is called awful beauty. I watched it and I saw there was law everywhere I looked. Like there's law in astronomy, the way the planets move. 
but there's law in cellular structures, the way cells, the way the nucleus works in relation to the electrons and neutrinos and so on. There's law in physics and chemistry and music and mathematics and psychology and astrology. There's, art, there's law everywhere. The forms all form is related to all other form lawfully, including your thinking mind. Your thoughts are all forms. So at that level, it's all lawful. It's just lawfully unfolding. It's a huge cause and effect machine, if you will. And it's all lawful. It's neither good nor bad. It's just the way it is. It's lawfully unfolding. This leads to that, leads to that, and these interact with this, and that's what you get. My guru used to say to me, Ram Dass, don't you see it's all perfect? Can't you come up for air for a moment? The predicament of gun is if you try to stand up there and see the perfection, somebody falls down in front of you and you say, karma. See, it's it kind of cold, you notice? But when you come down into your human emotional heart, the suffering is unbearable and you think your heart will break. There are battered children, battered women. There are Vietnam vets struggling. There are whales becoming extinct. There are trees dying from acid rain. There are homeless. In this land of plenty, there are homeless. I mean, where does your heart, what's a human heart to do? It hurts so bad. Where are you going to begin? You've got to fill that, put your finger in that, and that leak in the dike, and there's another leak. And, and finally, what you do is you armor your heart to try to survive as a separate entity. But when you armor your heart and you can become like, if you're in a service profession, you often become what's called professionally warm. You're very kind and caring and decent and you listen and you care, but you don't let your heart get too involved because you've got to save it for something, for home. But when you have seen the perfection of form, including the suffering, then that balances the feeling of the human heart. And you see that that perfection includes your human heart's pain. And then you start to expand to embrace the paradox. And it is a paradox for the mind. The paradox that it's all perfect and yet there is so much suffering and it stinks. And it hurts. The fact that in the perfection there's nothing to do, and yet as a human I must do everything I can to relieve suffering. And you start to stretch to embrace those paradoxes. You can't deny one part and have the other, but the balancing is what allows you to keep your heart open in hell. Because there is a place in you that is connected to a faith, a way of understanding the universe that says yes and this too, heavy though it is. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.